The Day of the Rope by Devin Stack Chapter 15 It had been several weeks since Wayne had first arrived at the hospital and his physical therapy sessions were going along nicely. Soon he'd be able to walk out of here and take full advantage of all the resources his new benefactors at Zycom had promised. In return for maintaining a reasonable stance on a handful of issues, of course. The most critical issue had been told several times to him was the issue of political violence. There had been an outbreak of violent incidents, and not just at political rallies, but in quiet, wealthy estates and, and expensive high-rise condos. Wayne didn't know what to make of it, but it seemed the elite, and in some cases their families, were being assassinated one by one. Wayne's contact at Zyacom only spoke to him about the violence at the rallies. In fact, the whole world was pretending these clearly coordinated assassinations of deep state operatives and war profiteers across the country weren't happening at all. Not a single mainstream outlet had breathed a word ab about any of them. Not even when Alice Green's former campaign manager was found murdered in a suburb of Washington. The mainstream media omitted the reports that he, he'd been tortured for hours. The coverage only lasted for about 20 seconds of airtime, while the newsreaders had spoken softly and in reverent tones about Brad's excellent service to his country and photos of Brad smiling his creepy smile cross-faded and then drifted gently across the television screen. They called it a botched robbery despite the fact that nothing had been stolen. Nothing to see here. If only the country had reasonable gun control, this tragedy might have been avoided, they all had to say. Wayne's new handlers would send him on a tour of all the mainstream media outlets to celebrate his recovery and to calm the masses. This time, he was promised that all of the outlets would be significantly less combative and maybe even receptive to his message for peace. More importantly, they would help promote the book that Zyacom was having ghostwritten for him. Freedom from Violence. They would purchase a new wardrobe for him and give him the keys to a conveniently located upscale apartment in Manhattan where they had built, a small, built him a small studio. Once his book tour was complete, he would have a ghost-written blog that would be fully staffed by Zyacom, approved writers, meme artists, and of course, there would be merchandise. Wayne would be flown out to various events, sponsored by his donors, and he would keep in constant contact with his fans via daily streams. His benefactors had every detail of his media strategy carefully planned out, he just needed to show up and do what he was told. Now that the shadow bans had been lifted from all of his accounts and they were no longer hidden from search results and trending topics, Wayne's audience and engagement levels went through the roof. Wayne had a new appreciation for the sudden tactics that the tech giants stealthily employed. The day they had lifted his shadow bands, his audience had grown nearly 20% in 24 hours. He wondered what the political landscape in this country would have looked like if these companies hadn't sold out to their globalist overlords in the first place. Would America have even fallen as far as she had? Zyacom never provided Wayne a script, and his new handler would, without a doubt, pretend to be scandalized if Wayne even suggested that they influenced what he said. She would also deny that she was the handler until she was blue in the face. 
Her constant flirting gave Wayne the impression that she was the kind of woman who would resort to sexual, mani sexual manipulation if he seemed unsatisfied with his illusion of choice. Wayne always pretended to be flattered and embarrassed by her compliments and played by the rules. He never once set foot outside the reservation. That would change when the time was right. Wayne didn't mind that the revolutionaries in the movement didn't understand his long game. For his strategy to work, the more extreme elements on the right would have to hate him and call him a shill. They were not the ones that needed to be coaxed into action. There would always be those who would try and shift the Overton window by force. But those were the people that didn't understand people. When Obama had to run for president in 2008, despite being a closet bisexual himself, he ran on a platform in public support of traditional marriage. Had he made his true views public, let alone if, anyone, if he had shoved his views down the throats of voters, he would not have been a serious candidate. He would have never won the pres presidency, and he would never have been in a position to subvert the culture for eight unrelenting years. The left played the long game because they understood people. Wayne understood people too. It had taken decades to lull the American people to sleep, and it was foolish to think that reversing the process was as simple as being the loudest alarm clock. The people had become complacent, and they had learned to love their prison cells. They feared change, and the kind of change that would be required to bring their civilization back from the brink wouldn't come without pain. The prison cells would have to become so unbearable that even the timidest of slaves would be driven to revolt. This process would happen on its own. The hordes of immigrants pouring into the U.S. and in Europe were bringing the problems of their home countries with them. They would, as all humans do, try desperately to adapt their new environment to fit themselves, rather then adapt themselves to fit their new environment. The Europeans behaved in the same manner when they colonized the globe. This was basic human nature. Once the demographics in the West gave non-Westerners the political power to enforce their way of life on the shrinking European minority, war would be inevitable. The descendants of the founding fathers would find themselves in an unsuitable in environment and would, as all humans, have since the dawn of man, seek to adapt their environment. However, deprived of political, social, and financial power, to effect this change peacefully, they would be forced to turn to the only methods left available to them. Fleeing to the new world was no longer possible. The ancestors of European Americans had lit, risked life and limb to escape their environment. They had found a new land where their oppressors had no power, and they had conquered it for their own. They had shaped the environment to fit their biology. Their descendants would be willing to do the same. Only this time there was no new world to flee to. Wayne saw the writing on the wall. The fuse was already lit. It was only a matter of time. It was only a matter of how long the fuse was. With every passing day, the chances of survival decreased. Wayne was confident that his people could survive, but their numbers were plummeting and their power was declining at an ever-expanding pace. At a certain point, their extinction would be a mathematical certainty. Wayne had to play the complex game of measuring his sense of urgency against the slowness of the Overton window. The Overton window that moved ever so slowly until suddenly it didn't. There were always watershed moments. The pressure building behind the shift sometimes behaved like the intense pressure that built up along fault lines. 
exploding with energy without warning once the pressure reached critical mass. Just like earthquakes, these events were almost impossible to predict. Wayne just needed to be there when it happened. At the first sign of a spark, he would pour the gasoline. Meanwhile, he would have to protect his access to the public. If that meant that people he admired and respected called him a philosophical lightweight or a shill, that was fine by him. He knew what his true legacy would be when the final curtain came down. It was now, as Wayne lay in his hospital bed considering these things, that he decided he needed to do something to protect his objectives. In a strange way, he felt as if he was being compelled to act by some intuition deep inside of him. Was it instinct? Was it God? Was there a difference? He still believed that religion had been used as a tool of control. It was likely an invention of the ruling class used to keep the peasants satisfied with their shitty lives by promising them a mansion in the clouds or 72 virgins waiting for them in the afterlife. Best of all, the rich people weren't invited. Every slave's fantasy. The slaves were told that faith was a virtue. They were instructed to serve unquestioningly under the boot heels of the ruling class. If they behaved themselves for the full duration of their mortal lives, they would finally be rewarded. There would be justice when they were dead and buried. The perfect scam. <laughs> All the same, he had felt a new kind of awareness since his recent brush with death. He supposed it could be described as spiritual, although he hated the term. It reminded him of low IQ Instagram whores or some pedophile celebrity accepting an award. He supposed in some ways he was a social media whore and a celebrity. Maybe the term was more appropriate than he cared to admit. Armed with this new awareness and feeling inspired, Wayne decided to record a message to the country. The message. The message the people weren't ready for, but needed to hear. If he recorded it now, he could guarantee it would be delivered. He waited until, until Eve had been wheeled out of the room for a bath and change of bandages. Then, using his crutches, he managed his way slowly and painfully into the bathroom. He knew it was unlikely that the room would be bugged, but after what he had learned about American intelligence agencies, he also knew that you could never be too careful. He turned on the shower and the exhaust fan in the ceiling and leaned up against the bathroom counter. He took a deep breath and then, after collecting his thoughts, he recorded the message that nobody was ready to hear. A few minutes later, Wayne hobbled with his crutches back to his hospital bed. He uploaded the video from his encrypted video app to a server he used from time to time for web hosting, files that he didn't trust leaving on big corporate cloud providers. When the upload was complete, he set up a script that would publish the video automatically to his social media accounts and his millions of subscribers unless he logged in and postponed the uploaded daily. He had just logged out of the server when he was startled by the door to his room opening with a crash. Eve, his roommate, was being wheeled back into her side of the room, and the way the orderlies handled the hospital bed reminded him of angry teenage grocery store employees collecting shopping carts in the parking lot for minimum wage. Eve had become increasingly hostile over the last few days and had even begun chanting Anifes protest slogans during some of his streams. The viewers ate it up, but it was starting to annoy Wayne, and his patience was wearing thin. After the orderlies wheeled Eve back, Eve's bed back into place, 
They left without saying a word to Wayne. Wayne got the impression that they too thought he was an evil Nazi. There was no telling what Eve had told them in an effort to get her own room. Wayne was beginning to think she would smother him in his sleep if she could get away with it. All the same, he liked the challenge she posed to his charisma and thought perhaps he could still win her over, eventually. End of chapter 15